We're going to start in one minute, just having a couple of technical issues, and then we will go ahead and get started. It's been awfully quiet. I know. <laughs> Good afternoon. Good afternoon and welcome to the uh, panel discussion commemorating the 50th anniversary of the March on Washington. Uh, my name is Henry Bailey and first I'd just like to thank you all for coming out and participating in, and, and being a part of this event. Uh, this is the first event of the year for, uh, that, that BALSA is a part of uh, along with Professor Yearby and I just want to bring her to the podium now to allow her to uh, say what she needs to say and introduce the, the, panel, the, the panel members uh, for today's event. Again, thank you and welcome. I hope you all enjoy it and walk away informed with some information. Thank you. Thank you. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. For I can never be what I ought to be until you are what you ought to be. And you can never be what you ought to be until I am what I ought to be. I wanted to start off with a quote from the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. Welcome, thank you for coming to our commemoration of the 50th anniversary on the March on Washington. I'd like to thank you for coming, for the panelists for coming and participating, and for the Dean who's not here but who supported this event. I am Rakaya Yerby, a professor of law at Case Western Reserve University. And before I introduce the panel, I just want to take this time to discuss where we have been, where we need to go, and to call upon you um, to challenge you to actually be a part of where we need to go. On October, on August uh, 28, 1963, over 250,000 people marched to Washington, D.C seeking racial equality and an end to poverty. The march led to the enactment of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, to the Voting Rights Act of 1964, and the end of school desegregation. Since the march, we have put an end to Jim Crow, but we have more work to do because there is still racial inequality and poverty. Some say, and I agree, that the true measure of progress is how far we have to go. And as the slideshow illustrates, we have not made enough progress because we still have racial inequality and poverty. The gains made as a result of the march on Washington and the civil rights movement have been eviscerated by several presidents, by Congress and most recently the Supreme Court. Therefore, we cannot spend our time patting ourselves on the back while people suffer in poverty and remain subjugated to racial hatred. We must act. So today to commem commemorate the March on Washington, the speakers will challenge you to join the struggle for jobs, for justice, and for peace. So that in 50 years from today, we will not talk about the unrealized dreams of equality, for voting rights, for quality education, for access to health care, and for an end to poverty. 
Instead, we will talk about the dreams that we have realized because we have demanded equality and justice for all. Without further delay, let me introduce the speakers and we will begin with our presentation. First, and I'm doing this in alphabetical order. First, we have Ben Cohen, who is office counsel at the Capitol Appeals Project, where he represents condemned inmates in Louisiana. In 2011, he was visiting litigation counsel at Harvard's Charles Hamilton Houston Institute for Race and Justice. Mr. Cohen has secured the exoneration of one client outright uh, reversals or sentencing phase relief for 10 clients and was involved in three cases before the United States Supreme Court, including Kennedy versus Louisiana. James L. Hardiman is legal director of the ACLU of Ohio, where he oversees complex litigation and strategy on a wide range of civil rights uh, issues. James is recognized as a national leader in civil rights litigation, best known for his cases that led to the desegregation of school and police departments in places like Cleveland, Lorraine, Alliance, Columbus, and Cincinnati. He has also served the Cleveland NAACP in a variety of significant volunteer leadership roles, including serving as first vice president. Justin D. Levinson is a professor of law at the University of Hawaii. His research focuses on the intersection of soci uh, psychology and the law, including empirical and sorry, empirical uh, research of psychological concepts embedded in the law. In 2012, he, along with Robert J. Smith, uh, edited a book, Implicit Bias Across the Law, published by Cambridge University Press. Robert J. Smith is an associate professor of law at the University of North Carolina School of Law. He previously served as a legal and policy advisor to Harvard Law School's Charles Hamilton Houston's Institute for Race and Justice, where he was responsible for the Institute's litigation e efforts. And as I said, I'm a professor of law here, and I focus on healthcare disparities, where I try to use empirical data to assess whether laws enacted to grant equal access to quality health care pose significant barriers to the victims of discrimination. Um, and now all the panelists will speak, each panelist will speak for around 15 minutes. Um, and once uh, we are done with the presentations, then we will open it up for discussion. Thank you. So, Mr. Hart. Uh, thank you, Professor Irby. That's uh, quite a challenge to have three uh, distinguished lawyers, at least two distinguished lawyers and me, and limit our comments to 15 minutes. Uh, <laughs> that normally takes me 15 minutes to clear my throat. Uh, but having said that, let me give you a brief overview of, of what I see as uh, the distance we've come and how far we still have to go. Uh, in 1963, I was 21 years old. I had just graduated from college, and at that time, as many of you uh, probably know, knew everything there was to know about everything. Uh, in the ensuing 50 years, I realized I didn't know quite as much as I thought I knew. Uh, I was a typical person, you know, first one in the family to graduate from to go to college, uh, first one to uh, go to law school, all that kind of stuff. Uh, grew up in the Huff area, which is not too very far from where uh, we are right now, and had an opportunity to go to a college called Baldwin Wallace College. Ever heard of it? Over in Berea. At that time, I lived in a dormitory and had two black roommates. And midway through the semester, I said, you know, this is kind of strange that uh, we have two black roommates. Uh, what are the chances of this happening since I only had about 15 black kids on the whole campus? And my roommates looked at me and said, look, Hardiman, you know, this didn't happen by accident. Uh, this was part of the plan. Apparently, they didn't think that I was the kind of person that would uh, benefit from having a white roommate. So even though Baldwin Wallace gave me a, uh, granted me admission, they didn't let me uh, room with white roommates back in the 60s. Having said that, one of the worst courses that I ever had to take was history. And uh, I'm on the adjunct faculty at Baldwin Wallace now teaching, guess what? History, <laughs> of course. Makes sense. And uh, one of the things that you know, I try to impart to people is to get an appreciation of how far we've come 
but yet how far we still have to go. And uh, those of you that are law students, if you haven't already, you will eventually read Plessy versus Ferguson. Does that ring a bell? Sure, Plessy is a person who tried to get on a bus, a uh, railway car, was told he couldn't because of the separate railway car act and uh, thought that the 14th Amendment meant what it said. You know, uh, the state is prohibited from denying to any person life, liberty, or property, or equal protection. So he thought equal protection meant equal protection. Well, in reality, it didn't. So in 1896, when the Supreme Court uh, had occasion to rule on the Plessy challenge to the separate railway car act, uh, they said that separate facilities were permissible as long as they were Equal. So we get the separate but equal doctrine. And even though in Plessy's case it was involving uh, uh, railway cars, it eventually applied to other areas of public accommodation. For purposes of this discussion, it applied to schools. So we had schools that were separate and in theory equal. But in reality, separate was far from equal. Separate meant that the white school was the Taj Mahal building Think of uh, Little Rock, Arkansas, if you've had occasion to see that, Central High School on TV, uh, and the little black schoolhouse uh, where the African American students went. So Charles Hamilton Houston and Thurgood Marshall, a young Thurgood Marshall, decided they were going to challenge that. They were gonna make a change, and what they did is they went around and they recorded uh, the black school and the white school, same city, uh, all over the country, all over the South, actually. And they concluded that uh, Separate was not equal, had not been equal, and there was no attempt to make it equal. Uh, white students were afforded many opportunities that black students were not. And eventually, and you all know this, the Brown versus Board of Education case, but Brown wasn't the first case to challenge school desegregation. There were a lot of cases that led up to Brown. But most of those cases were premised on the fact that if there was to be separate but equal, it had to, in fact, be equal. In reality, it was separate, but not equal. So they had to make the separate facilities uh, equal. And if they couldn't do it, they had to admit the black students to the previously all-white school. When I came in the building, I saw the Alvin Gray uh, uh, sign. Have you guys seen that? Uh, it's outside. Uh, Alvin Gray graduated from Western Reserve University in 1951. And the reason he went to Western Reserve University was because he's from Alabama, and Alabama wouldn't admit him to any college in Alabama. So since he couldn't go to college in Alabama, they agreed to pay his way to an institution out of state. And he came to West, Western Reserve University, or what was known as Western Reserve University at the time. Uh, still alive, still practicing law, and that was the uh, modus operandi. Uh, black people that lived in the South could not get admission to the previously all-white schools, and, su and as such, they decide, they, the state would pay their way to go to schools out of state. That's how Alvin Gray ended up coming to Western Reserve University. And I've heard him speak on a number of occasions, and he has said that one of the things that he promised himself is that when he graduated from Reserve University, Western Reserve University, stopped in Columbus to take the bar, went on down back to Alabama, he was going to attack everything that he could that smacked of segregation. So Attorneys like Alvin Gray, attorneys like Thurgood Marshall, attorneys like uh, Charles Hamilton Houston chose to attack this institution of Jim Crow. And in doing so, they made a concerted effort to uh, litigate cases like Brown versus Board of Edu Education. Uh, now, Brown was a Southern case. Actually, Brown consisted of five different cases, all of which were consolidated under the name of Brown versus Board of Education. Uh, but Brown, as we now know, was decided in 1954, and the Supreme Court said uh, separate is inherently unequal, separate cannot be made equal, and the stigma that attaches to students that attend segregated schools is such uh, an overwhelming stigma that it cannot be accepted. So we thought in 1954 it's pretty straightforward. You're in segregation, right? Uh, wrong. Uh, because it wasn't until the next year, 1955, the Supreme Court gave guidance to some of the schools and said that they had to desegregate with all deliberate speed, you know, whatever the hell that means. Uh, does it mean right away or does it mean drag your feet and uh, 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 make it as difficult as possible for as long as you possibly can? Now that was 54, 55, long, long, long time ago. Uh, in 1973, I was one of the attorneys that filed the Cleveland school desegregation case. It was called Reed versus Rhodes. 
um, oftentimes mischaracterized as the busing case. The reality is we filed a lawsuit because we had figured out that Southern uh, segregation uh, was open and obvious because in the South they said blacks can't go to school with whites. They either had a law that required or permitted segregation of the races. You've seen, some of you have anyway, uh, the Little Rock Nine, pictures of students trying to go to uh, Central High School in Little Rock, the National Guard keeping them out. <coughs> Cleveland was the mecca. We didn't have those problems in Cleveland, though we did have segregated schools. And we realized that the segregation that existed in the city of Cleveland was just as bad as the segregation that existed in Little Rock, Arkansas. So we filed a lawsuit and people said there's no way you can win because of the fact that the segregation that exist in the city of Cleveland is based on housing patterns. Seems like a plausible explanation, right? Blacks, people li blacks lived in one part of town, whites lived in another. Therefore, the schools were innocent reflections of the neighborhoods that they served. That was the defense. Though they did admit going in that the schools in Cleveland were segregated. So admitting that they were segregated was the first step. Now, the question is, how did they get that way? Well, we were able to do a lot of historical uh, uh, research um, we were able to hire demographers and they drew maps and we realized that when black people first came to Cleveland from the south during the 30s, 40s and parts of the 50s, they were segregated in certain neighborhoods, uh, generally the central area. A few black people got out to Collin, not Collinwood, Glenville, uh, a few got into the Huff neighborhood, but basically Cleveland was a segregated city. But the Board of Education drew boundary lines in a segregated manner. They assigned teachers in a segregated manner. Uh, uh, they built schools such that the predictable effect of those schools would be segregation. So in 1976, Judge Frank Battisti issued an order finding that the schools in Cleveland were segregated intentionally in violation of Brown. Now, that was the easy part. Looking back, it was easy. The real challenge was, what do you do about it? You've got segregated schools. You've got intentional actions on the part of certain state actors that created, fostered, and maintained racial segregation. So what do you do? Uh, the first thing you do is you create uh, an environment in which you assign teachers without regard to race. I was hired out of college to teach at Glenville High School. Just like my experience at Baldwin Wallace College, that was not by accident. Glenville was a black school. I was black. They sent me to the black school. White people that graduated from Baldwin Wallace College the same year were sent to white schools. So the easy thing was to simply uh, assign teachers without regard to race. The next easy thing was to redraw some boundary lines. Uh, stop all of the uh, 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 problems by creating a counseling environment in which counselors were inspiring or encouraging black kids to go to college and to do some of the things that they had been denied the opportunity to do because a lot of black kids uh, they went to Cleveland schools, uh, ended up uh, being encouraged not to go to college, but to do certain things other than go to college, get a good job, uh, uh, repairing shoes, uh, sweeping floors. Those are good, honorable uh, uh, opportunities for black kids. So Cleveland was kind of a microcosm of what was going on in the nation because there were similar lawsuits filed in Boston, in uh, Detroit, uh, in San Francisco, in uh, Denver, Colorado, and uh, well, all over the country. The effect of those lawsuits was an attempt to eliminate racial segregation in the public schools. Did we succeed? I think the jury is still out on that because Cleveland schools, as are many of the other schools, are in fact as segregated today as they were prior to the time that we filed the lawsuit. Now. That's the educational component. The other part of it is uh, the issue dealing with affirmative action because affirmative action, uh, as we know, those of us that study this kind of stuff, was uh, first uh, mouthed by uh, John F. Kennedy uh, when he mandated that we had to take some affirmative steps to eliminate uh, segregation. Uh, so is affirmative action good or is it bad if we uh, listen to uh, What's his name? That uh, guy serves on the Supreme Court named Clarence, somebody or other. Uh, if we listen to him, affirmative action is not uh, uh, the solution to the problem. Uh, if we listen to him, the Bakke case, which was, what, 1978, 
uh, uh, was a step backwards. Uh, does an institution have an affirmative obligation uh, to maintain a diverse student body? Would Case Western Reserve University be better off if it, was, if it consisted of all white students? Or should we make sure that some other different uh, diverse <coughs> voices are heard? I would submit that uh, obviously we are better, we are richer, we benefit from hearing different voices. Now, uh, this past summer, the Supreme Court in Fisher versus Texas uh, uh, decided that affirmative action was not dead, that we had, uh, our schools had a continuing opportunity to maintain a diverse student body. Was that right? Uh, the Supreme Court will revisit this issue this coming term, and we will have an opportunity to see whether or not uh, affirmative action is something that we should uh, uh, anticipate uh, going forward. Have we solved all the problems? It's been 50 years since Martin Luther King gave his I dream, Have a Dream speech. Have we gotten to the point where uh, uh, we judge people by the content of their character as opposed to the color of their skin? Unfortunately, I don't think so. Yes, we had the Civil Rights Act of 64, uh, right after Kennedy died in 63. Uh, we had the Voting Rights Act of 65. We had the Fair Housing Act of 68, all of which were intended to create uh, uh, a better society. And now we have an African American that sits in the, uh, uh, at the seat of government in the White House. I've heard people say that we now live in a post-racial era. And if you believe that, I've got some cheap land that I can sell you in Florida. But yes, we have a black president. Yes, we've made huge steps. Yes, many of the demonstrations, the March on Washington, uh, the passage of the Voting Rights Act have meant a lot to us, and we've made progress. But I think that unless we recognize that this is just a step in the right direction, uh, I think it will be an opportunity lost. Now, I came prepared to give about a two-hour uh, speech, and I keep uh, getting the notes that I've already used up 15 minutes of my time, so I thank you very much for being so attentive. referred to Fred Gray. He actually was the attorney uh, for Rosa Parks. Um, and if you read his book, he talks about how they kind of discuss uh, her um, going on the bus and how they brought in this young preacher to help them, who is Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Um, so if you want your hand up. I'll put it up. Thank you for having me here. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, my topic for today is a snapshot of our modern world, and it uses social science research to try to understand what's the modern picture of bias in America. Um, if you take a look at these two photos in your slides, how many of you are still trying to figure out what you're looking at? It's not hard, right? Why? <laughs> because your mind uses schemas shortcuts to remember information, to look at the photo and say, well, that's a chair, I'm just gonna sit in the chair. Or that's a steering wheel to a car, right? I, I hold it when I drive. You don't have to sit there for 30 minutes trying to figure out whether the chair is gonna fall over when you sit on it, or how the wheel is connected to the automobile, right? Our mind uses these shortcuts in a way to help us navigate a very complicated world. But, when this happens, unfortunately, we're far from perfect, and that's what I want to explore with you today. Um, broadly speaking, and I'm going to spend the rest of the time talking about implicit bias and stereotypes, but broadly speaking, I want to point out that there are a lot of errors that our minds make on a regular basis, and most of these errors are not controversial. So if you take a course on behavioral law and economics, or you read that scholarship, you recognize that there's a whole list of cognitive biases whereby our minds take steps that they shouldn't, right? We make errors in economic calculations. I'm not gonna spend time on it, but recognize that implicit biases and stereotypes are just one type of error that we make, albeit one with quite serious consequences. So what are 
implicit biases. Implicit biases are automatic processes. So just like the shortcuts your mind used to determine that was a chair and that was a steering wheel, our mind categorizes information based upon group membership and group membership that connects to stereotypes. These happen automatically and largely outside of our conscious awareness. Um, the vast majority of Americans hold these stereotypes, implicit attitudes and stereotypes. Recent studies suggest, for example, black-white stereotypes. People exhibit an implicit preference for white over black. About 90% of the population displays that. Uh, this has been tested not just on college students, but on hundreds of thousands, even millions of people, including judges themselves. Uh, it's also important to note that if I were to ask you right now, do you think that you hold these implicit biases, you might not know the right answer. We don't have conscious awareness necessarily of our implicit processes. So if I ask you on a questionnaire to report your racial attitudes, those would likely diverge quite considerably from what we would find in a test. So what I want to do is show you some of the methods that we use and then talk about some of the consequences in our legal system. Um, okay, so I'm going to show you two examples. The first example is called the shooter.